going to refer to climate change basically as global warming since climate change is a product of global warming so i will refer you know to global warming than possibly climate change but it's obviously understood that uh climate change is subsumed under the term uh, global warming and also uh i don't you know i know you're you're a uh, a casual guy and i don't mean to appear too stiff and uh, start but uh, a lot of times i'll address you as professor mcpherson because you've been so badly uh, treated for so many years i just want to accord you the professional respect that you so richly deserve so. well i very much appreciate that and please call me guy i requested all oh. my students for 21 years to call me guy so okay guy. There, there's, okay, there's, there's enough good. things separating all of us Okay, very good. All right. And All before, right, so we, we, before we start, please let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to update this information in a relatively short manner, because mm-hmm. I haven't done that for a while. I just sort of keep mm-hmm. up as things show up for me, but I haven't done any comprehensive research for a few years, and, and now I have. So thanks okay, for that. Well, well, I'm glad I could help you, with saying that uh, the journey to... Uh, Ever greater enlightenment, as you say, you know, should be the goal of all uh, all human beings. Right. I'm glad to uh, glad to help in that regard. Uh, also, just another kind of bookkeeping thing. You know, I, I said an hour. If we go over an hour, that's fine, and I will, uh, you know, pay you. Let's say, you know, for the additional time. So, uh, if we go we over an hour, if we go over an we, hour, that's fine, and you don't need to pay me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, shall we start? Kind of, let's say, you know, with the uh, the first question that I posed. Yes, absolutely. About the ice free Arctic and the t- chain of events to follow. Yes. Okay. So if you if if you would, guy, kind of please, you know, start on that. Right. So the the rapid transition from white ice and snow to dark blue will profoundly reduce albedo, sometimes known as reflectance. And the transition to an ice-free Arctic Ocean is already proceeding more rapidly than any other such event in history. And it is accelerating the self-reinforcing feedback loop that's already underway with respect to open water and albedo. The clincher is that according to a peer-reviewed paper in geophysical research letters written by, and I don't know how to pronounce these people's names, so I'll just give it my best shot, but Christina Pistone and colleagues published a paper on June 20th, 2019 in Geophysical Research Letters. And they indicated that the transition to an ice-free Arctic Ocean is equivalent to 25 years of contemporary emissions, or about a trillion tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And they indicated that that would occur the May after the initial ice-free Arctic Ocean. So that's huge. You get 25 years worth of emissions in the May following the first ice-free Arctic Ocean is serious potential additional warning. So that's the primary first result of an ice-free Arctic Ocean. The rapid warming of the Arctic Ocean is already leading to many species found in the Arctic, formerly found only in the tropics and subtropics. And most notably, that includes a bunch of fish, primarily because fish are big enough and pretty easy to track and also sport fisher, sport anglers are paying careful attention. But the increased temperature that will occur very abruptly will almost certainly lead to the 50 gigaton burst of methane, described by Natalia Shikova and her research team in late 2008 at the European Geophysical Union meetings. Such a burst of methane, they, they said at the time in their abstract, is, quote, highly possible at any time. And then she re- repeated that in other interviews that she did in 2013 and 2014. And she indicated in a November 24th, 2013 interview that such a burst of methane would rapidly warm the planet by one degree C or more. So that's fast. And this, this, what, what very few people understand is that this rapid rate of change is what threatens all life on Earth. It's not a number per se, it's the rapidity with which we change the environment to which so far all organisms have adapted over evolutionary time. In addition to reduced albedo and increased methane, there are two other factors that will lead to rapid temperature rise at the global level. First the loss of aerosol masking, the best kept secret in climate science, as you've undoubtedly heard me say, and that would add at least two and a half degrees Celsius, and an additional water vapor feedback. And 
that's the one-to-one -one feedback for every one degree increase in global temperature resulting from the use of fossil fuels, we get an additional one degree because of the water vapor feedback. As the planet warms, more water evaporates. That evaporated water serves as a lens in the atmosphere and causes increased warning because it's acting like a lens, like, like I played with when I was a kid trying to burn up ants with my little magnifier. So that's the overall story. Did I miss anything? And is there, do you have further questions about that? Uh, yeah, let me just say also, if I, if I bring up, let's say, other sources or other uh, uh, scientists or whatever, uh, I don't mean in any way you might say, you know, to cause you offense, but I'm just kind of, I like to just kind of cover all bases and whatever. I appreciate uh, your skepticism. I, yeah, I mean, a, a number of times, uh, fairly recently, uh, I've heard uh scientists and uh people let's say kind of refer almost kind of casually and uh, acknowledge the reality of an ice free arctic in the summer sometime in the next number of years or whatever uh but they kind of regard it as it's certainly a very undesirable outcome but they don't regard it basically let's say as sounding the doomsday clock so what what are they missing well i suspect they're afflicted, as most of us are, with a profound sense of privilege and specialness. I'm not sure that's a word. But we, for some reason, humans have always believed that we were more special, better than, superior to other species. And so what affects those other species will not necessarily affect us. We're smart. We'll always find a way out of it. Blah, blah, blah. And because scientists in general, and I saw this on campus for 21 years, scientists in general are very narrow in their approach. In fact, you get rewarded in the university system for becoming increasingly knowledgeable about a decreasing range of information. So the, the, the more informed you become, about an increasingly narrow topic, the more you're rewarded. In addition, the university system does not encourage in any way people getting out of their silos and going across campus to work with other people. After being in existence for 20 years, no, no, it was more than 25 years, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the School of Natural Resources, now the School of Natural Resources and the Environment on the University of Arizona campus, asked me to become the first person to hold a, a joint appointment in those two separate departments. And they were, they were across college lines. One was in the College of Science, the other was in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And it just it basically isn't done. And since then, to my knowledge, there have been two other people who have crossed those boundaries. But there's just very little incentive to do that. And typically, the incentives run the other way. To hold out in your own fort is typically better for your career than crossing disciplinary boundaries. So I think there's a couple of reasons. I'm, it's... It's really an indictment of human behavior, what goes on on university campuses. And I don't know that there's any way around that, except to find people at the level of deans and below who support that kind of interdisciplinary interaction. But it's, it's very frustrating to see that go on. And it, along with half a dozen other factors, was one of the reasons I left. I just... I just couldn't take it anymore, the backbiting and infighting and strong focus on a siloed approach. Guy, this is uh, an issue which is, was not on the, on the list of uh, questions and, uh, and issues, let's say, that I forwarded to you on Wednesday. Uh, I was going to ask it to, at the end, let's say, of our discussion, but I just feel it's kind of appropriate now. 
uh, it's tragically obvious, you know, how you've been rendered a pariah and, uh, and the attacks and the, uh, slander and libel, the calumny and the, that you've been, uh, subject to, but do any of the, any scientists, any people would say in the, uh, uh, prestigious, uh, authoritative national or international organizations, this has anybody contacted you on the sly, so to speak, saying, you know, guy, you know, you're saying, you know, what I'm thinking, but I just don't have the courage to do so. It would basically, you know, smell the uh, doom for me uh, professionally and financially, whatever. I mean, do you get any of that kind of, you might say, under the radar uh, feedback from scientists or government officials? Not one. Not one. Okay, no. that's... It's... It's incredibly disappointing. At this point, you know, it's been five years since the defamation campaign peaked, and I suspect I've been completely disappeared. I've been rendered invisible for all practical purposes. So, you know, for a while there, I was making some pretty good traction. At least I was reasonably well known. I was getting slandered by really well informed and highly privileged people. Now, it's as if I don't exist. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know which is better, to be no, honest. I was going to say, <laughs> I, I was gonna say you, know, it can, uh, you know, not existing in their eyes can have its upside as well. So it's, uh, Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's very frustrating because it was never about me. It was about my message that I was trying to transmit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that, that nearly 8 billion people will die ignorant, uninformed, and confused is the issue here and that's that's what i was trying to overcome all those years on campus and i still am because apparently i can't help myself and right. so that that's what is the bothersome part that that this coordin, coordinated defamation campaign has not just destroyed my public life but has destroyed mm-hmm. access to knowledge that people really deserve to have mm-hmm. well you can't help it this, uh, say teaching is not uh, or was not your job it's not your profession teaching Teaching is your calling, so you just mm-hmm. you're just called upon to do it, no matter right. what the circumstances. So let's uh, let's move on to uh, issue number two. You know, as far as your experience with Bill Nye in uh, September 2015, and as I as I say in my question, I realize that effectuating that complete 180 degree turnabout in his thinking in a span of six hours was the consequence of uh, the sum cumulative total of the discussion you had with him as you were walking around your homestead. But as, as I say you know, in my last sentence on uh, item number two, in retrospect, are there any one, two, or three things in particular you think that were most instrumental in so completely turning around his thinking on the subject? Yes, absolutely. Methane. Methane, methane, methane. It, most people okay. remain uninformed about the power of methane. Methane is at least 150 times as great as carbon dioxide in terms of warming within the first few years. What the IPCC has done, what almost every scientist does, is project out to the next 100 years or to 2100, the next 80 years. And sure, methane degrades over that period of time but and when it does it degrades into carbon dioxide and water vapor so it 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 transforms itself into two greenhouse gases that most people most people are aware of at least carbon dioxide most people are not aware of water vapor as a greenhouse gas as the most abundant greenhouse gas and methane remains pretty much off the radar for most people and that included bill nye he just was he seemed to be completely ignorant about methane which you know he's not really a scientist so and 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 he does science education, but on a broad array of topics. So I guess it shouldn't come as a big surprise. But in any event, there it is. Second, secondly, my, my description of the rate of environmental change was convincing. And my academic career as an ecologist and conservation biologist makes my voice pretty unusual with respect to that factor. The rate of environmental change is something that 
almost nobody talks about. People talk about a number. You know, we're going to go extinct if we reach seven degrees or nine degrees or six degrees. Or, and, and that's not really the relevant factor here. The relevant factor is how rapidly the environment changes. That's what we and other organisms are adapting or not adapting to is that rate of environmental change. This, you know, this goes all the way back to Charles Darwin and his 1859 book, The Origin of Species. So we've known about this for a long time, but if you're a physicist or an atmospheric scientist or you know any number of other professions, you just have never connected those dots about the rate of environmental change and how it might affect organisms. So I think that was a big deal for him. And finally, I suspect he was convinced by my ability to cite literature off the cuff. So for example, the paper by Quintero and Weens had been published in Ecology Letters about two years before Bill showed up in New Mexico. And it, this is the one that indicates there is a, a 10,000 times lag in the ability of organisms to keep, of vertebrates to keep up with the projected rate of change. And of course, this was projected in AR5, the IPCC's fifth big report, because this, this was in 2013. So AR6, the latest version, had come out yet. So, but, but I had that back in the back of my mind that, that vertebrates can't keep up with the slow projected rate of change, the rate of change projected by the IPCC. And I was able to come up with that off the cuff. And, you know, Bill, like most people, was impressed when any of us can remember anything longer than about 15 minutes. Yeah, particularly this society. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, well, it's uh, seven years since uh, that uh, meeting took place in September 2015. You have not received any communication from him? No, in fact, I wrote to him when I had a radio show with the Progressive Radio Network and received no response. And mm -hmm. same thing with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, who had a role in that uh, right, right, right. Thing as well. So, you know, they both know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. but they aren't talking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's it's pretty easy to understand. Bill has, or at least had, years ago, homes in Manhattan and somewhere on the West Coast. I think Los Angeles. So, he's doing okay. He knows about the potential loss of privilege associated with speaking about the wrong things and mm -hmm. and of course Schwarzenegger is doing fine himself right 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 you know he knew uh, about this when he was mayor and it never came up <laughs> yeah yeah governor. oh sorry governor not mayor well I was going to say I could uh, you know a, a number of uh, people have posed a question to you uh, <clears throat> why why isn't this being uh, discussed uh, within the media or by the uh political and governmental figures and whatever so tying in uh, I can understand it because I guess you know their feeling is is if the <coughs> populace <coughs> ever really knew ever really comprehended how horrific the situation is and how imminent in effect it would cause a societal disintegration in one form of another <coughs> I, I might just you know offer let's say you know, one perspective, perhaps let's say that you're feeling about people that they they should know uh, before the S hits the fan for them. And so they, you know, so that they're aware of what's going on. They can live their remaining years, as you say, pursuing a life of excellence and doing the things they need to do personally as far as repairing or solidifying relationships with family, friends, etc., but I would say that that's probably a, a somewhat idealistic perspective. I think, you know, most people, it would produce, let's say, very dire consequences. Uh, first, well, among the least of which, people would stop, you know, doing what they need to do. I mean, high school kids, you know, would stop stunning doing their homework. You know, they said, what the hell difference does it make? You know, where I go to college, you know, I'm, I'm going to be uh, toast, you know, within a few years anyway college students, similarly the same thing, you know, would not be a, 
busting their humps, you know, try to get into graduate school and get the right job. People would not be paying off their financial obligations. They say, the hell with it. I'm not going to pay my rent. I'm going to pay my mortgage. I'll just kind of uh, gin the system as long as I can, and I can, you know, stay in my abode. The only, the only uh, case that wouldn't work is with uh, if somebody leases a car, because then they'll send out a repo man, you know, to come out and get your car. Right. But everything else, nobody would fulfill any financial obligations, and that's only kind of just, you know, the starter. Right. I mean, it could it, it could unleash a lot of dark forces. I mean, people say, you know, I kind of had this grudge against this guy and you know and now I'm kind of really going to act out or I wanted this woman and now I'm just going to take her I mean it could unleash a lot of horrible dark uh, scenarios I couldn't so, agree more and you know, so quite quite frankly guy I I could understand why uh, effectively nobody you know wants to put this out there out there to the public right and uh you know, so I, I can understand that. It's also 95 plus percent of the cases, people would just dismiss it and reject it outright anyway. They say, well, that's just your opinion or blah, blah, blah. So, Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't hear that every day. <laughs> you know, my, my dream, no. and maybe it's just a dream, my dream is that it would turn out like The Last Night of the World, Ray Bradbury's short story that I've mentioned online before and that you can find online with relative ease, the last night of the world. And everybody knew that it was the last night of the world. And nobody from the East Coast got on a plane and flew to the West Coast to add three more hours to their life. They just, they accepted what was coming. And there were no riots. People didn't get crazy. They just said goodnight to the one that, ones they love and went to, went to sleep. And, and then there's this quote that I'm sure you've heard me say from John Kenneth Galbraith, the renowned economist, in his book, The Age of Uncertainty, from 1977, people of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we are a nation of relatively privileged people. I, I count myself in that group, primarily because I'm white and heterosexual and a male. You know, and, and those things combined have given me enormous privileges throughout my life that still continue. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I mean, yes, I think yeah. you're right. People that, that are in the know are banking on the dark side of humanity when people actually do find out what's going on. I would like to put my money on the, the other side, the last night of the world side, where mm -hmm. where people will behave in a decent manner, but we don't know, do we? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, we don't. And, and and Ray Bradbury, you know, is is a piece of fiction. He doesn't know either. And exactly. I mean, let's put it this way. I mean, I don't tell my family or friends about it. I've a couple of times with friends, I've kind of alluded to it or whatever, but you know, I I tread gingerly, you know, on that path. I mean, because let's face it, they don't want to hear, and if they have kids or that became grandkids, they, they don't want to hear that. Right, and absolutely. Uh, so no, and I, I don't blame you for not informing people. Yeah. A and yet, yeah. at least once a week, I receive a message from somebody thanking me because they know and they've had an opportunity mm -hmm. to complete those relationships. And yeah. so, you know, <laughs> I still feel like I'm doing the right thing here, even despite all the feces flung my way, we'll say. Oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And my, my comment was not in, intended in any way, shape, or form. You know, let's say as a uh, right. I understand a recommendation. You know, as far as you're, I was just kind of speaking. Let's say uh, you know, taking you know, taking this you know from another perspective. I should also say, uh, just to interject. Uh, I actually understand very well uh, what you suffered and where you're coming from. Because it would not be too much of a stretch to say I am to the reality of U.S. foreign and military policy and the way the U.S. media function, the way you are, let's say, to global warming and climate change. Well, uh, well you should just I, shut up then. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I'm just, uh, you know, I mean, a, a number of years ago, I took an evening course at the New School for Social Research on U.S. foreign policy. I wasn't taking it for any utilitarian purpose, not for any uh, graduate degree, whatever, but just to you know, to 
further embellish, let's say, the, the uh, degree of knowledge that I had. And the second uh, course of that class, the professor said that I should be up there, you know, teaching that class. And the professor was no slouch, having published four books, co-authored three more, and edited three more. And he also had a good political head. You know, he didn't just see things in the narrow, uh, distorted, fraudulent way in what to say U.S. history and foreign policy are taught. Uh, he knew kind of, you know, what the U.S., you know, was really about around the world and has been about for decades and for generations. Yes. And uh, I also had the occasion to meet uh, Phil Donahue several years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Phil Donahue, when he had the most uh, popular uh, show on uh, daytime television, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and whatever, I mean, he had the occasion to interview and talk with the leading figures in, in every discipline. Absolutely. As well as, yeah, you know, as well as kind of non professionally, all the people he kind of met and hobnobbed with uh, at parties or whatever. Right. He was the daytime and, equivalent of Johnny Carson in his day. Yeah, yeah. And Phil has a good political head. And I'm, a, I'm on the board of a number of uh, peace and justice organizations. One of them is Peace Action. So uh, we were having our 50th gala in 2007. And uh, Phil, who was emceeing the event, was good enough to host a reception for uh, the officers and uh, major donors uh, before the event. And I was talking with him for a while and he was blown away by the breadth and depth of my knowledge. He kept saying, you should be on television. Well, somebody who says what I say would never be on television. Right. Or if they were, if they, were they would be gone. And Phil Donahue himself is a prime case in point. Yeah. Because after uh, Phil Donahue went or lost, I don't know if he lost, he just decided not to do the, uh, the daytime grind any, anymore. He had an evening show on MSNBC that a lot of times he co-hosted with Vladimir Posner. And Phil's show was by far the most watched and most uh, uh, popular show on MSNBC's entire uh, nighttime lineup in the late 90s, early 2000s. But then starting the fall of 2002, Phil uh, Phil went where he should not have gone. Uh, he started coming out strongly against uh, the, uh, the move toward war against Iraq. He had a number of prominent uh, people as guests uh, who spoke out, not, not, not just spoke out against the war, but presented all the facts and data and evidence undermining the, the totally fraudulent uh, premise that was put forth by the, by the Bush administration. And Phil was called on the carpet, not just by the president of MSN, MSNBC, but by the uh, president of NBC itself, Thornton Bradshaw. And he was uh, told that uh, going forward, he had to have, quote, at least two pro-war guests for every one anti-war guest. Well, Phil wouldn't uh, knuckle under, and he lost the show in uh, in the early winter of uh, 2002. So anybody who dares speaks the truth, you know, never, let's say, uh, stays on the air or kind of keeps his or her column in, right. in a newspaper. Right. It uh, is, it's at every level. Yeah. So, but I could tell you, However, let's say negative has been the reaction you've received over the years from people telling your unwelcome, your unwelcome message. I can tell you, speaking the truth about what the U.S. is doing around the world, bringing to people's attention the crimes, the atrocities of crimes against humanity that are routinely and systemically committed by the U.S. and have been for decades, for generations. Uh, you want some negative reaction of one, one form or another. That'll certainly do it. And uh, so I I just want to say, just you might say it as as an aside, I understand full well kind of what you've experienced these past number of years. Uh, Anybody, let's say, who understands what this country is about and the way the media kind of lies about it, you know, serves... President Eisenhower is the one who first coined the term uh, the military-industrial complex and is... Farewell address in January 16, January 1961, talking about the incestuous relationship between the Pentagon and corporate America. Well, the same phrase could be coined as far as the media and the government. It should be the U.S. government media complex. Absolutely. As a media, as a media function is nothing more than propaganda arm of the government, particularly Absolutely. When, it comes, when it comes to villainizing uh, a given country, government, or head of state who is in the crosshairs of the U.S., they just kind of, they they just kind of swing into action, you know, just as much as say as 
German media did in the 1930s and early 40s. So it's, uh, I mean, you're seeing it now in spades as far as Russia and Ukraine. I mean, it's a complete version of fact, truth, and reality. So I just wanted to, don't want to spend, hello? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Okay. I hear a buzz. I don't know if my battery's going. But I just, you know, wanted just to throw that in that I I can identify and understand full well, you know, what you Right, you've and unfortunately, been experiencing. You brought up Eisenhower, and the first mini drafts of his speech included Congress. It was the military, industrial, congressional complex, and right, right. and he was informed that that was not going to play well. And this is right, right. this is this is a powerful president who's on his way out. He can you would think he'd be able to say whatever he wanted, but no. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there are more so, powerful figures at work here than United States presidents. Right. Yeah, they're, in large part, they're kind of figureheads. Right. I, I, I just wanted to, uh, so I, I just wanted just to mention that, so kind of you have some more of an idea for where I'm, quote, coming from, so to speak. Right. I, I'm just now very much also interested in the third item guy about... <clears throat> about Professor Glickson and his sources. Yeah, and, and you know, and... And it's, is, is there any definitive, authoritative, quote, objective source for the gauging the world's temperature the way there is for gauging the carbon content in the uh, atmosphere at Ma- Mauna Loa right. measuring station in Hawaii? Right. So, so let's take both of those. Um, th- there are a few, maybe several, ongoing attempts to track global temperature over time. The best known is NASA's GISS, Surface Temperature Analysis, that's Goddard Institute for Space Science. So it's called GISTEMP, G-I-S-T-E-M-P. So that's the best known. The European Environment Agency is the European version of it, and both of those organizations have shifted the baseline so that 1750 is no longer relevant, which is too bad, but not surprising. I'm sure there are a few others out there as well, but um, I don't, relying upon government or multi-governmental agencies is a prescription for exceptional conservatism. That said, the IPCC, as I've reported several times, has concluded that climate change is abrupt and irreversible. This is the kind of news that should be on the, on the news every night, it seems to me, but you never hear anything about it anymore. It was more than a couple of years ago when those reports came out. Have, they, uh, have, have NASA and the European counterpart, you say they've shifted the uh, baseline, have they shifted the baseline to a common year, or they each have different years? They, they both rely upon 1850, and they admit that we're over one, over one degree C above the 1750 baseline, but <laughs> and and as we know, the predecessor to the IPCC concluded that one degree was the upper limit. And then, and we also know, based on David Spratt's work, that we triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops at about a half a degree. So, you know, there's all this nonsense about specific numbers, two degrees, one and a half degrees, blah, blah, blah. And none of that matters given that we've already triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops. We're already in the midst of the most abrupt geophysical event in the history of the planet. And and even the IPCC admits that we're in the midst of abrupt and irreversible climate change. So, uh, we, you know, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of energy paying attention to the media that clearly is echoing the governments of the world in their mm-hmm. exceptionally conservative m- mm-hmm. misinformation. Yeah, getting back to Professor Glickson, guy. Uh, right. So, what is Professor Glickson? What is his latest reading as far as how much above seventeen fifty baseline uh, current temperature is? Well, he discusses this issue in his chapter of the Event Horizon, the fifth chapter called "The Age of mm-hmm. Consequences." And of particular note is a figure created by James Hansen and nine other colleagues for their paper in the Open Atmospheric Science Journal. That was published in 2008. That version was published in 2008. And the figure that they put in that 2008 journal article 
indicates the rapid rise in global temperature as Earth emerged from the last ice age, and that rise in temperature was and is expected to accelerate. So it has accelerated since they published that paper in 2008, probably written in 2007. And that's one of the things that Glickson points out, is that they, they noticed and documented this very rapid rate of change coming out of the last ice age. It continued to accelerate, and especially over the course of the last two decades before they published that paper in 2008. And of course, we've really put the pedal on the metal since then. So he, Glickson does a good job in that fifth chapter, giving an overview of where we're at and how we got here. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, I've, you know, let's say for the following comment, but uh, I, I've, I, I do have, let's say, I, whatever, I've got an intelligence which kind of, you know, can't help kind of always operating and probing. So I, I don't mean to in any way discredit Professor Blixen, but I just kind of point out one thing that struck me. About a year ago in one of his articles, uh, kind of talking or whatever about the global warming and the uh, an ice free Arctic, and it stated that July fifteenth, which is the the end of summer in the uh, northern hemisphere. Now, of course, as we know, whether summer is being measured uh, meteorologically or astronomically, July fifteenth is is not the end of summer. Right. And, and, and that just struck me. I mean, you, one could kind of, you know, try to dismiss it well as kind of an oversight or quote a typo, but then I think, I mean, wouldn't he kind of carefully uh, review an article before publishing it? Yes, one I would mean, think so. That's more than two months off. Yeah, I know. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's two months off if, yeah, so I, I in a sense, I, I can't, you know, get that out of my mind, so to speak. It just it sticks in my craw, right. uh, intellectually. I mean, that that kind of major error. Uh, so I, I'm just putting it out there, just you know, for what it's worth. I mean, right. just something. it was, it was, it was an article I said was published, published last summer, you know, I believe. And right. it's, uh, I just, I kind of thought that was just a, a strikingly wrong-headed statement. So right, what, and yeah. and. You know, Andrew Glickson has done some pretty unseemly things to me as well, and I'm not going to hold that against the science he publishes. James Hansen has called my idea of, of abrupt climate change crazy. That's a direct word. Right. Crazy. Yeah. So, no, but, but still, I continue to rely upon their scientific work, even, mm -hmm. even though I could take issue with them personally, and, and I have. Right, right. Well, as I said, what I brought up is... is uh, is, is not uh, addressing anything personal, just kind of like, quote, scientific, you know, to make that kind of a right strike, strikingly wrong-headed statement. So in other words, it just kind of, it, it registers, so I just kind of can't have that. Right. Um, Any, anyway, okay, so I, I, uh, I guess I can't get, you might say, the, the precision and the, uh, and the backup for for a degree of global warming since the 1750 baseline. I guess that there right. is no definitive authoritative source, I guess. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And okay. uh, with the exception of Glickson. And uh, we know that it doesn't matter. We know mm -hmm. that the IPC's predecessor, the advisory group on greenhouse gases, right. indicated right. that one degree was the upper limit. And, and, right. and everybody admits to that at this point. You know, right. the yeah. U.S. federal well, government agency, the European Environment Agency, both admit that we're past one. Yeah, I mean, the only thing, let's say, that I've seen, let's say, from kind of, you might say, uh, kind of mainstream sources, I mean, they, they seem to uh, acknowledge that uh, we're at 1.2 degrees. Even your uh, your erstwhile colleague, who unfortunately kind of, when he started getting a measure of success, uh, kind of turned against you, uh, Darja Male. I mean, even he acknowledges, you know, one point two degrees. So it's, uh, yeah, okay. So I guess right. I'll just have to. Uh, I guess I'll just have to wait on that, or so. Right. Uh, but, but even if it's at one, the point yeah. is that when we get to a certain temperature above the seventeen fifty baseline, we're going to trigger those self reinforcing feedback loops, and any one of which indicates that climate change is irreversible, and and we have. 
And nobody denies that now. Even the IPCC concludes that an overheated ocean was responsible for the irreversibility of climate change. That was in September 2019. So I, I don't think anybody anymore is arguing that we have already triggered self-reinforcing feedback loops. And I guess the only question is how many and what kind of interaction goes on between them and, and how, how bad is it really? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we could argue about that from now mm-hmm. till forever, and apparently people are willing to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on to item number four, uh, you know, which is self explanatory. Right, the, uh, the, the focus on habitat and, and my right. general ignorance of. Um, storms and and especially monsoon like storms with respect to intensity, duration, frequency, right, blah, blah, blah. And, base, and, base, and, and and heat waves and, and right. whatever. In other words, the, the the catastrophic effects that most people would associate, you know, with the uh, worst outcomes of global warming. If you would comment upon that, please. Right, that that brings to mind an an interesting anecdote. Pauline, when were we in Greece? 2017? 2017. 2017. When we were there, they were in the midst of a heat wave, brilliantly called Lucifer, and and yet I read in the corporate media, what two days ago, last week, last week that that the United States is in the midst of the first heat wave ever named in planetary history. Wait a minute, we've been naming them for a long time. Anyway, that's an aside. Right. <laughs> Back to those significant events that intensities, durations, and frequency is greater than anything we've observed so far. More than a decade ago, I read a line that stuck with me. Don't talk about the obvious. And so that's what I'm doing. I don't talk about the obvious. It's a, it's a waste of everybody's precious time. You know, I, I could go on and on about the outcomes that we're already seeing and there's at least a couple of YouTube channels dedicated to just that uh, Mm -hmm. describing on a very regular basis one of them for a while was going five days a week with a 15 or 20 minute video explaining and and putting together all the news clips from all over the world indicating that climate change was responsible for these intense floods and these incredible droughts and on and on I don't know if that channel is still around anymore, but you can find that stuff everywhere. And I have better things to do with my time. So that's why I have shied away from that, those kinds of, reporting those kinds of outcomes. Okay. Uh, Okay, item number five, you know, so you've, you've read it. Oh yeah. uh, Yes, yeah, yes, just, absolutely. You, you're, you're sort of sticking with the 2100 notion. Yeah. And, and. On, no, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't sticking with it. I, I was just using that for illustration purposes. As okay. I say, you know, like in my, in my, in my lead sentence slash paragraph, you know, just, just using, as I said, as an illustration, as an illustration, you know, right. that in the 2090s, all hell would be bro- bro- breaking loose. And that uh, the, using the 2030 drop dead uh, date, the 2020s are equivalent to the 2090s. Right. So I then kind of go on, you know, you know, to say some things that it. Uh, yeah, and why does it seem so normal at this point? Yeah. So, so that's the bottom line there. Yeah. Uh, a phrase from my departed dad comes to mind: "Better lucky than good." Mm-hmm. We're we're at the highest global temperature ever recorded with any civilization present, according to a July 18th, 2017 paper by James Hansen and 14 other colleagues. It was published in Earth System Dynamics. It was titled, crazily enough, Young People's Burden, Requirement of Negative CO2 Emissions. And it's, it's crazy because in the paper, these 15 scholars were basically demanding that young people fix the, per- the crisis that James Hansen's generation and my generation have created. <laughs> and that, that seems like a tough call in light of abrupt irreversible climate change. In any event, that was five years ago and the planet has not cooled since then. So we, 
we're, we're on the warmest planet with civilization present. And to me, this just indicates how fragile the situation has become. And you and I know that an increase in industrial activity will drive us to Pliocene-style conditions as soon as 2030. That's based on a peer-reviewed journal in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from, what, uh, late 2018, so nearly four years ago now. And yet I don't hear anybody ever talking about that paper in the midstream, in the mainstream media. It's, it's a like, like the IPCC reports from 2018 and 2019 about the abruptness and irreversible, Ill, irre, irreversibility of climate change. And that paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences relied upon the IPCC's representative concentration pathways that, of course, ignore aerosol masking and dozens of self-reinforcing feedback loops. So that's my first comment, is as soon as 2030, taking a very conservative approach, we're headed for Pliocene-style conditions. And it was a degree and a half or two degrees warmer Celsius, obviously, in the Pliocene than it is right now. So we're we're on the ramp for much warmer te temperatures in a very short period of time. We're also headed for a dead ocean. All life on Earth originated in the ocean. And according to an April 8, 2020 paper in Nature by Tresos and colleagues, quote, we project that future disruption of ecological assemblages as a result of climate change will be abrupt because within any given ecological assemblage, the exposure of most species to climate conditions beyond their realized niche limits occurs almost simultaneously. Under a high emission scenario, and they use the representative concentration pathways, number 8.5, such abrupt e exposure events begin before 2030. And so again, relying upon the IPCC and its representative concentration pathways, very conservative, they, they come up with the ocean will begin dying this decade. And all of that so far, of course, depends upon maintaining industrial activity and if the recent past is any indication, increasing industrial activity over every five year period of time. But as you know, and I know, and almost no climate scientist is willing to talk about a reduction in industrial activity will cause significant additional planetary heating due to the loss of aerosol masking. So that's the, that's the general overview, but I want to say a little bit more with respect to the outcomes. If local and regional farmers are to be trusted, then they are having an increasingly difficult time growing food in this already unpredictable climate. All agricultural hardiness zones in the U.S. have shifted northward in the last 20 years for the first time since they've been keeping records which is now over 100 years. And obviously that's bad news. In New York, for example, the hardiness zone has shifted from a 5 to a 6 in the last 20 years, and even to a 7 in Long Island. It's not only local and regional farmers being tested by the rapid rate of environmental change. On November 3rd, 2020, the peer-reviewed literature Journal of Industrial Ecology published a paper by Gaia Harrington titled update to limits of growth, comparing the World 3 model with empirical data. And what Harrington did was offer the third formal update since Limits to Growth was published by the Club of, Club of Rome in 1972. So Dennis Meadows was the lead author on the, on the original and on the first two updates. And here in the peer-reviewed literature, Harrington has an analysis that indicates that consistent with the findings of the original 1972 version of Limits to Growth, the collapse of the world food production will occur in 2028. The collapse of world food production will occur in 2028, if we're going to put a, put a number on it. However, this 2020 paper also points out that world food production is already lagging behind the human population. Consider, for example, the state of food security and nutrition in the world 2021, that's the latest available assessment from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And that report finds that between 720 and 811 million people were hungry in the previous year, 2020. Nearly one in three people did not have access to adequate food in 2020. And undernourishment affected 
10% of the world's human population. And obviously, I can't imagine the situation has improved since 2021, and that report was published. So, at the local level and at the world level, our ability to grow food is on the decline, and yet we still have an increasing number of people every day. All that tells me that the bad news that is being experienced in many places in the world is headed towards all of us in the not too distant future. Yeah, although obviously for a while that's going to be unfortunately concentrated in the, in the predictable countries. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, and even, let's say, you know, in this country, let's say among the predictable segments of the population. You know, uh, an, an, an argument could be made that the reason we're in Ukraine is because that's one of the world's wheat producing areas, large grain mm-hmm. producing areas. And, and so it's not just about natural gas, which is, you know, fossil fuels are the go to reason for Americans and their wars for the last many generations. But there's also food there. And if, if things are falling apart as rapidly as the evidence indicates, and the quote powers that be know that things are falling apart that quickly, then there's really nothing to lose by launching another military endeavor, it seems to me. Yeah, well, as well also to, uh, to try to weaken Russia, to try to kneecap Russia. I mean, it's... Uh, Absolutely. It's, because, I mean, uh, why kind of the demonization of Russia and China? Because Russia and China are the only two nations with the potential to challenge the U.S.'s uncontested, uncontested global hegemony. Absolutely. And, uh, so that 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 is true. I, I might say, I, I assume I can say this, that you're certainly, <laughs> is that you're not bound by any of the uh, idiotic biases and prejudices uh, politically and everything. But uh, No, I'm an anarchist. I, I've been an anarchist in, for a long in, time. An, ex- an excellent uh, antidote to the, uh, as I said, to the uh, propaganda, disinformation, lies. Uh, that Americans are being uh, uh, hit with all the time by the by the U.S. government media complex. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see it on the TV anymore since since it's been blocked and uh, and censored. But the website rt.com, RussiaToday.com, is uh, contains a lot of valuable information and insights that you know that you're never going to uh, going to hear. Or, uh, hear or this kind of, I just made that comment, kind of talking about uh, the war in Ukraine and. Uh, so, you know, things that, uh, you know, we will never, let's say, be told here. Of course. Uh, you know, my, when my brother was a practicing journalist before he became a professor, he used to say things like, if you want to know what's going on in the United States, you read the news from other places. So if you want to know what's going on in the United States, you read RT and news from every other country that you can find. Maybe the BBC, yeah. though that's questionable. And the same goes for learning about other countries and their politics. You, you don't turn to the Politburo for information right. about what's going on well, in Russia. You know, yeah, I, I, I know you've said this uh, before, Guy, you know, a couple of years ago. However, I would, uh, I would take issue with that, is that the U.S. media are the last source of accurate, truthful information about any country in the world, <laughs> not just the United States, <laughs> but, but about any country in the world. As I said... I assume, have you heard of the organization Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR? Yes. yes. I'm sorry, did you see it? Yes, no. yes I have. Okay, I'm, I'm on the board of FAIR. I mean, I analyzed all their Sunday uh, morning news programs for them from 1987 to 1997. And again, you know, I, I don't mean to boast or pat myself on the head or whatever, but when I volunteered to work with them uh, a few weeks after I started, they you know, said to me, what do we ever do to deserve someone like you, your real gift? Uh, yeah, that, you know, what your brother said, it, it's a glib generalization, which is, as to use your words, it's it evidence free. The U.S. media are the absolute last source of accurate and truthful information about any country in the world. And also, a little known fact uh, virtually every American thinks that the techniques and methods of modern propaganda began under Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Uh, you know, that's uh. That's a, that's a quote fact that, you know, all Americans quote, no, like countless other such facts. It's a non-fact, an anti-fact. Right. In fact, what Hitler and the Nazis did, they went to school and what the U.S. did during World War I mm-hmm. is that when Woodrow Wilson was running for re-election as president in November 1916, he ran as a peace candidate. 
No sooner was he reelected than he does a complete 180 degree about face and is trying to gear the country up for war against Germany. But he had a problem since the American people did not want a war against Germany. That's one of the reasons why they voted for him in 1960, 1916. So what he does, he enlists the leading lights of the then burgeoning uh, fields of advertising and public relations. People like Ivy Lee, who uh, did uh, propaganda for, for Germany in, in U.S. media in the 1930s, and Edward Bernays, who uh, laid the uh, uh, propaganda groundwork for the U.S. Uh, overthrow of the democratically elected government of Guatemala in 1954. And people of that ilk, and he created a propaganda organization called the Committee of Public Information, CPI, not to be confused with the Consumer Price Index. <laughs> and uh, they cranked out article after article demonizing Germany and Germans and concocting the most lurid, horrible atrocities that they supposedly committed. One of the more uh, uh, kind of infamous and noteworthy of those was the... Uh, the uh, concoction of German soldiers bayonetting Belgian babies. Anyway, inside of a few months, they had converted the American public from being against war with Germany to foaming at the mouth at the mention of Germany or Germans or the Kaiser, so that uh, uh, Americans of German ancestry were ducking for political cover. They were anglicizing their names, changing Schmidt to Smith, Ox to Oaks. People would not own uh, German dogs, not the obvious... Uh, the German shepherds or Rottweilers, but even even little dachshunds and symphony orchestras would not play works by German composers. So, you know, we're seeing the same kind of crap here, at least in New York. The New York Philharmonic a few months ago was saying they would not play works by uh, by Russian composers. So, the, U, the the U.S. created and developed the techniques of modern mass propaganda, and even before 1917, you know, the U.S. was uh, was was leading the field. Uh, completely inverting fact, truth, and reality when uh, uh, workers were you know, trying to organize against the brutal low working conditions they suffered in the late 19th century, the early 20th century. Uh, they were under savage attack from companies, from state militias. Uh, not only were they beaten in club, but they would be bayoneted, stabbed, and shot at, as well as their wives and children when their wives and children accompanied them on demonstrations against unjust and unfair working conditions. But how, you know, the media completely inverted it. At that time, there weren't photographs, there were daguerreotypes. And so whereas, let's say, when the workers would be the uh, targets of being bayoneted and stabbed and shot at by, by militias and uh, local uh, police, the picture that appeared in papers would completely, completely turn it around. So that was the workers who were the ones who were armed with clubs, with knives, with machetes. And just in case uh, any of the readers missed the point, they were drawn as it with subhuman ape-like fe features with the hmm. long kind of hairy jaws and arms kind of dangling down and, and hairy, almost ape-like rather than human. Mm -hmm. So uh, with all due respect to your brother, it's, uh, <laughs> that, is, that, that, is, that is not the case. The, the, the U.S. media are the last source of accurate, truthful information about any country in the world. And it's, uh, as I said, George Orwell uh, would be aghast if he were alive and Hitler would be green with envy. Right. And the most, no most notable case, even more than the Ukraine or whatever in Central America, the villainization of the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. Right. Go government described by the United Nations as, quote, more committed to the elimination of poverty, injustice, and oppression than any government on earth. And also described by uh, a delegation of Canadian parliamentarians as having shown more Christ like forgiveness and Christ like humanity than any government in world history. That they, the Sandinista government, can in any way be villainized, uh, you know. You know, so it would be shocking. Or Orwell would be a guess, and his Hitler would be green with envy. And the Reagan administration also created an entire propaganda uh, agency to uh, carry out its uh, goal of, quote, slowly demonizing the Sandinistas. That, that organization was called the Office of Public Diplomacy. It operated under the aegis of the State Department. And uh, it, it coordinated and directed the Reagan administration to a relentless torrent of anti-Sandinista propaganda, disinformation, and lies. 
And William Casey, who was director of the CIA under Reagan, said in uh, speaking about the uh, Reagan administration's uh, propaganda and disinformation efforts, that Casey said, quote, we know our disinformation campaign is complete when we get the American people to believe everything that is false, close quote. So, and, you know, e even so-called liberals and progressives, the, uh, the, the rarest thing you, one would find would be unhedged support of and unqualified praise for the Sandinistas. There are always kind of caveats and, and hesitation and whatever like that. So again, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean you know, to go on so long, but I, I know a lot about this stuff and it, uh, well, I, I really, it, you, really, it, it, I really have, let's say, a, you know, a powerful kind of, you know, visceral, uh, connection to it. I was also on the, uh, board of uh, Nicaragua Network, which is now uh, Alliance for Global Justice, and has moved from Washington and was based in what was formerly your home base of Tucson, Arizona. So uh, no. I, I, you know, I really know my shit, so to speak. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, in fact, it's, that's, that brings me to a question I have for you, because you do know your shit, obviously, far more broadly not, than I do. I think the most important person in American history, certainly within the last hundred years, is Edward Bernays. Not any president, yes. not any military leader, but Edward Bernays. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Well, he's one of them, as I said, along with the aforementioned Ivy Lee. Uh, yeah, as I said, Edward Bernays is the one, let's say, who uh, helped, helped the U.S. government and the, you know, the CIA and the Pentagon engineer the uh, overthrow of the democratically elected government of, of Jacobo. Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954 and plunged Guatemala into a 40-year national nightmare, 40-year hell. Uh, I, you know, I've, 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 I've read and still read, you know, the first-hand accounts of the savagery of the butchery committed by U.S. client regimes all around the world and it's the equal of anything the Nazis did, it, minus the, the gas chambers. But as far as the butchery and the savagery, it's horrific. But I mean, yes, Edward Bernays, uh, the father of public relations, I said that the one who uh, was instrumental in uh, preparing uh, the American public for the overthrow of Guatemala's uh, democratically elected government and putting an end to uh, what was known as nine years of spring in Guatemala of unparalleled peace, tranquility, and uh, and prosperity from 1945 to 1954. So yes, uh, that, that would not be at all far off the base to say that Edward Bernays was probably the most uh, important and influential uh, personage in, uh, in U.S. history. Right. Uh, it's... Uh, yeah, but as I said, you know, the reason I hesitated, I mean, uh, Ivy Lee, who worked with him at the uh, Committee for Public Information in 1917, uh, he, can, uh, he can pretty much share the dais with, with Edward Bernays. And well, I was going to say, there's a lot of bad company there, isn't there? Yes, there, there, <laughs> there, there, is, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of bad, you know, a lot of bad company. And the lies are not only lies of commission, but lies of omission. Absolutely. I mean, like the getting back to Ukraine, you don't hear, you know, the way it's portrayed that this government, there are noble, valiant people under siege by the big, bad Russian bear. I mean, it's, 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 it's a government of fascist neo-Nazis and Nazis and came to power in an ultra murderous coup in May of 2014 mm -hmm. and kind of invaded the, the, uh, the Russian speaking and, uh, and Russian, uh, uh, Ukrainians of Russian origin in the eastern uh, Ukraine, known as the Donbass, and murdered at least 14,000 uh, Ukrainians of Russian uh, extraction. Uh, and many of them being tortured and mutilated, and the women raped and gang raped. And I've, I thought I've kind of read, uh, particularly as far as U.S. forces in Latin America as well as Asia, and uh, I've kind of, you know, heard and read, uh, you know, the worst, but they perpetrated what the, the perpetrators themselves called, quote, the orgy. I forget exactly when it was, but uh, from first-hand accounts, is that the uh, the infamous Azov battalion of this Ukrainian regime, and uh, 
in the, the right sector or whatever that they they raped uh, infant and baby girls between one, one and four years old and made their mothers watch and the perpetrators of this uh, un, ungodly act themselves termed quote the orgy close quote so it's uh, as I said the lies and propaganda are every bit as much about what we're not told as the way the powers that be manipulate twist and distort what we are told so it's uh uh, it, it, anyway, it, it just it just goes on and on and on, and, you know, and there is no there is no end to it. So just right, kind of kind of addressing something else you said. I know you know I understand your reluctance. You know you don't want to play the blame game and you know shaming or whatever. But I I can't help it. I mean, knowing what I know about what the U.S. has done around the world and is currently doing, that uh, that U.S. regimes are the most sa- savage and barbaric of any world history mm-hmm. knowing that knowing that the uh, US has been most responsible for the uh, holding the world hostage to the nuclear reign of terror since August 1945 the only nation that uh, has used nuclear weapons twice and uh, I I do hold I do place paramount responsibility paramount uh, culpability on the shoulders of the U.S. for the environmental uh, crisis soon to morph into the environmental catastrophe. I mean, absolutely. Both, the, both in the both in the fact that as the uh, U.N. stated in uh, 2013 that the United States has been responsible for 29 percent of the world's greenhouse g- gas emissions, and the U.S. with four percent of the world's population has been responsible for 29 percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions in the last 150 years and five times the amount of emissions per capita, as is China. Again, you know, the fraudulent narrative that's portrayed in this country, well, it's the U.S. and China, and the U.S. is trying to, you know, pull back, but China, in its headlong, you know, rush to uh, ever greater economic development and coal and whatever like that, you know, the U.S., you know, can't do much. So one is that the U.S. has been the leading producer of greenhouse gas emissions, and two is that the U.S. has been the world's... uh, main obstacle and an obstructor as far as any and all attempts by the uh, nations of the world uh, to come to any kind of uh, climate agreement which could in any way have any possible hope of at least slowing or mitigating the worst effects of climate change. I, and I know you you feel that you know, the die is cast, but starting with from the first uh, of those uh, climate conferences, the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, when the U.S. single-handedly undermined uh, uh, an, an agreement which was basically just on the cusp of being signed to 2009 when Barack Obama comes in basically at the last minute to pull the plug out from under a pending uh, climate agreement and earn the plaudits of the ultra-right-wing editorial page of the Wall Street Journal which lauded Barack Obama's, quote, the Copenhagen Concern, or close quote, to, I mean, we both know, you know, the... Uh, you know, the Paris Climate Accords were a crock, and you know, even James Hansen called them a fraud and more pointedly bullshit. But one uh, climate uh, conference, perhaps you would disagree with, but which I would think I would think was probably the most significant attempt by the nations of the world to come together to form some type of agreement that again could possibly, let's say, in any way, at least maybe mitigate the worst effects was the Kyoto Climate Accords known as the Kyoto Protocol of 2000, uh, 1997, brought together all, at that time, 182 member nations of the United Nations. And uh, the key operative step in that was ratification. Signing was purely symbolic, but the key operative step was ratification, because when a nation ratified the Kyoto Protocol, it formally committed itself to abiding by the uh, goals of the Kyoto Pro- Protocol, which were to re- uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2014. And every nation ratified the Kyoto Protocol, you know, the usual, let's say, uh, you know, boogeymen, Russia, Iran, China, and also, let's say, the the most populous, rapidly developing nations such as India, Indonesia, Malaysia. Every nation ratified the Kyoto Protocol except one. The United States was the only nation which did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. The U.S. Senate 
which is a governmental body that has the power to ratify international treaties, voted 95 to 0 against ratification mm-hmm. of the Kyoto Protocol. Mm-hmm. So every, every Democrat as well as every Republican voted against ratification. Every Democrat voted against ratification despite the fact that Democrats uh, occupied the White House and Democratic President uh, Bill Clinton, Democratic Vice President Al, Mr. Inconvenient Truth Corps. So, so I, I, I've, I pinned the uh, environmental tail on the U.S. donkey. I mean, but, the U.S. But, I'm sorry? But repeat after me, fellow Americans, we're number one. Absolutely. We're the greatest, we're the best, we're number one, Yeah. You know. And I can tell you, you know, despite its reputation as a liberal city, New York City is not liberal. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's it's been, I mean, it's, it's liberal, let's say, in a kind of meat and potatoes kind of democratic way or as far as domestic social issues such as a woman's right to choose or same-sex marriage or uh, or gay rights or whatever. But, uh, you know, as far as like Ukraine, I mean, some of the crap you know, that I hear, you know, here and... Uh, and after the first war against Iraq, which is a slaughter rather than, you know, which is a massacre rather than a war, I mean, the Pentagon held two uh, parades in the early June of 1991, one in San Francisco on June 3rd and one in uh, Lower Manhattan, the so-called Canyon of Heroes, Heroes Lower Broadway on uh, June 10th, 1991. And San Francisco, a genuinely liberal city, there were 10,000 people uh, who were out there, you know, to cheer on our brave Bright men in uniform, there are 20,000 counter demonstrators. June 10th, in uh, the so called Canyon of Heroes in Lower Broadway, there were a million and a half people taking part in that obscene celebration of that massacre, that slaughter. Is... I'm going to say massacre because, according to the Pentagon, there were 157 U.S. soldiers who were killed. Not one of them was killed in combat, either died from a uh, uh, stroke, heart attack, or friendly fire, whereas according to then Navy Secretary John Lehman, there were 200,000 Iraqis who were killed. 157 to, to 200,000, that's a kill ratio of more than 1,300 to 1. And a million and a half people taking part in that obscene celebration. So, yeah, it's Americans, they're the most brainwashed people, you know, of all. And, uh, as, as, as stand-up comedian Bill Hicks pointed out at the time, that wasn't a war. A war requires two armies. Right, right. Is- anyway, it was a pleasure speaking with, with you, and, uh, and you know, quite possibly in the future, I'd like to maybe set up another consultation. That would be fine. This has been most enjoyable. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Okay. Bye.